And I invite you to join me for a word of prayer this morning. Father, we are blessed that we have the privilege and the opportunity to gather in your house today to be able to come and to worship you. I'm grateful for each person who's come today. Most grateful for your presence in this place today. And we've come to glorify you. And I know, Father, there are many distractions in our lives. But I pray that during the next few minutes, we'll be able to focus, that we'll be able to look and think on you that as we sing and as we pray, as we spend time in your word, as we listen to you speak to us, that the praise that comes from our heart will be genuine. That the words that come from our mouth will come from grateful and worshipful hearts. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Join us as we sing Footsteps of Jesus. Jesus. 
continue to worship in this room. I'm a
I invite you to open the Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. Our message this morning is entitled, The Hidden Treasure. Matthew, chapter 6, we'll be looking at verses 19 through 21. Probably some familiar verses to you if you've been attending church or grown up uh, attending church. Matthew chapter 6 verse 19 and when you find that passage in your copy of God's Word or are able to look on with somebody or follow on the screen today I would invite you out of reverence to God's Word to bow your head with me this morning and take the next few moments of quiet meditation time and invite God to speak to your heart this morning. Take a few moments of silent prayer, then I'll lead us in a word of prayer and read our text. Father, we are able to sing that we are free this morning because of the freedom we have from our sins because of what Jesus Christ has done. And I am grateful that I have that freedom. I thank you that I have the privilege and the freedom to be able to share your word today. And I pray that during the time of the message today, that we won't hear from me, but we'll hear from you. That it will be your word that quickens our hearts through the Holy Spirit today. That speaks to us. And that we'll not just be hearers, but doers of the word as well. Bless the time that we have in your precious word today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19, the Bible says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust corrupts 
and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, <clears throat> there will your heart be also. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. Life is certainly full of wants. In Sunday school this morning, in John chapter 6, listening to Pastor Rod share about things people are looking for and things that people want out of life, looking for the way to heaven, the way to eternal life. We all have wants. There are things that we want, relationships that we want. I have learned in my life a few things. One of them is <clears throat> that it seems like the only thing that gets away uh, in the way of what we want is usually the cost. You want a new car, but what gets in the way? The cost. You want a new house? What gets in the way? It seems like the price gets in the way. We all have different wants. Uh, I'd rather have a boat than a diamond. My wife would rather have a dog than a boat or a diamond. We each have our own <clears throat> individual wants and desires. Matthew chapter 6 is part of what we often call the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus gathered his followers and his disciples together, and he shared a series of teachings about what real life is all about and how we should live our lives day to day in the society, family, or whatever we find ourselves in. It's all about real life. It's all about what God wants and expects from you and I. And I want to share two principles with you this morning. I hope you'll write them down. Hope you'll spend some time digging back into this scripture during the course of this week. First, I want us to ask the question, what determines a treasure's value? And then the second question I want us to look at today is, what will you do with your treasure. What determines a treasure's value? <clears throat> Verse 21 says that where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We all love stories about buried and secret treasure. We love to read about the excitement, the thrill, the riches. But for most of us, those stories are kind of far away or make-believe. The people that Jesus was speaking to had a little better grasp and understanding than you and I do today because for us, the concept of buried treasure is kind of make-believe or happens to somebody you might have heard about or watched on television. But to the people of Jesus' day, that was a very real and normal thing. The people in their culture didn't deposit their money or their goods in a safe deposit box or in a bank. Generally, what they had of value, they would bury. Whether it was an individual's uh, finances or whatever, or the families, or even a small nation or tribe in the case of Israel, and they would bury those things. Israel was a land that's situated geographically in between a number of other major world civilizations, and thus Israel was invaded often. And the only way to safeguard what you had was to bury it and not let anybody know where it was so that it couldn't be found. So when Jesus spoke to them about burying something, that was everyday thought for them. Often they would bury those things, and when war came, they might be killed, they might be captured, they might be carried away. And consequently, it was not unusual over the generations and centuries for people to find buried treasure in biblical and other lands because that's what people did with their valuables. Huh, imagine that. I don't know about you, but I've always wanted to dig up a buried treasure. I've always wanted to find some treasure map that nobody had ever seen before and gone off on a quest 
and find that treasure chest and break the lock on it and open it up and find a pirate's chest full of gold and jewelry and all those kinds of things. And I'd be really excited, not because I found a bunch of jewelry, but because of what I could buy with all of that treasure. Huh. Some years ago, W.M. Thompson was a missionary actually in the land of Israel. He had gone to share Christ with the people in Israel. While he was there, one of his neighbors who was digging up a garden in their yard came across some ancient clay pots. In two of those clay pots, they found 8,000 solid gold coins that were imprinted with the insignia of King Philip and his more famous son, Alexander the Great. Imagine that, digging up the garden and finding a vast wealth of treasure in your yard. If that happened to your neighbor, what would you be doing tomorrow? All of us would be in our backyard, digging for everything we have. We'd be getting a metal detector, whatever it was, because we think if they could find a vast treasure in their yard, we might be able to find something in our yard. Do you ever ask yourself what makes something valuable? What really does make something valuable? Well, I look at two things that make something valuable. One, what value or how bad I want it. And second, we often place value on what other people say is valuable. So if there's something that I really want, it's more valuable to me. I'm driving down the road, and my wife is constantly telling me, eyes ahead, watch where you're going. Because inevitably, when you're driving down the highway, some truck pulling a boat will go by. Whoa. I have friends who stand outside and they hear the drone of an airplane and they go, whoa, that's a B-19 whatever. I didn't even know an airplane was going over. That's not valuable to me. We go to Cedar Key to eat and I want to eat on the water. Why? Because I want to watch those boats go by. And I'm like, look, there's a Carolina skiff. Look, there's a Bayline. Look, there's a, that thing's got this. That's got that. That's got this. And my wife's going. And I'll be the whole time going, look at that, look at that, look at that. And the only thing that will even pique her interest is every once in a while a dolphin will surface out there. And she'll be, did you see that? Did you see that? And I'm like. Yeah, that's the newest model they have from Nautistar. I saw it was awesome. It's like, no, dummy, the dolphin that was swimming out there. Oh, yeah, I see the fin. That's pretty awesome. That's not as valuable to me. Some of the value we place are based on what we want. Sometimes we base our value on what society says we should place our value on. And so things become more valuable based on what society says. Let me give you an example. You can go to the mall. Notice I said, you can go to the mall. And find the most expensive jeans. And you tell me, what will those jeans have? Holes in them. Are you kidding me? I, 
See, society says that's what's valuable. You can buy a pair of tennis shoes at Walmart for $10. Or for $300, you can buy some tennis shoes with a logo or somebody's name attached to it. Why? Because society says that's valuable. Now, let's remember, we have things that we consider value, I consider value, things you consider value that I may not consider valuable, but we all have things we consider valuable. Society tells us this is more valuable than that's more valuable. And yet, when it comes to real value, what really determines what value should be? Jesus taught his followers and disciples that day about treasures and what you think is a treasure and what you think is valuable. And he tells us to think not with a earthly mindset, but with a heavenly or eternal mindset. What does eternity say is valuable? Not what does the world say or what do I say is valuable, but I need to take what I want and lay it down next to what God says is valuable, what eternity says is valuable. I need to look at what society says is valuable and lay it next to what does God say is valuable. I love what 1 Timothy says, godliness with contentment is great gain. You see, the problem is we have believed the lie. We have believed the lie that more things will bring us contentment or other things will bring us contentment. Because once again, we're either looking at what we want or what society tells us we want. And the Bible tells us to look at the godly things and to desire the godly things more than the earthly things to desire the things that will matter for eternity more than the things that will matter only temporarily. And so you and I have got to stop. We've got to stop where we live. And we've got to begin to question our wants and desires. And we have to put them in line with what does God want and desire from me. From our houses to our shoes. What does God value? What difference will it make eternally? I can tell you that for the most part, what the world values is generally not what God values. Now, that's not true across the board, because there are some, still some good values in people. But generally, if I see something the world says, that is something that's important, that's something you need, for me, the red flag automatically goes up, and I at least stop and think, wait a minute, what would God say about that value? What is that going to matter in 100 years when I'm in eternity? What value will it place then? I will challenge you if you're a child of God today, if you're a believer. I will challenge you in your heart and then in our invitation time in a few minutes to be willing to say, God, I am going to begin to look at things, the big and the little things. Not from what I want, not from what society wants, but what you want. And I'm going to make a commitment today that says, I am going to look at things with an eternal perspective from now on. Whatever it is, I'm going to look at it from an eternal perspective, not just an earthly perspective.
That brings us to our second point, and that is what will you do with your treasure? You see, I believe with all my heart that you must know what you value. And once you know what you value and what's really valuable, then you have to determine what am I going to do with it. Let me give you a statement here. Knowing what you value will determine your decisions. I don't want you to miss that today. That's why I put it in print before you. I want you to think about that for a moment. Knowing what you value will determine your decisions. What you want, what you value, what you desire. Those desires, those wants will determine what decisions you make in life. That is a biblical principle. Know your value because they will determine your decisions. The problem is most of us aren't really sure what value to place on things. Well, I, I, Pastor, I really don't know what value to place on, like my house, I need a place to live. My vehicle, I need something to drive. I need clothing. So what value do I place on things? Well, I can help you out with something that's at least helped me out more than anything else. You've heard me say it many times before. I'll say it many times again before I die. And it's this. You own anything that can't be gone in an instant. You own anything that cannot be gone in an instant. I have a house. It could be gone tomorrow. I have a vehicle. We know it could be gone. Let me get a little more personal. I have my health. We're reminded of ourselves and other folks inside our church family. Just like that, it can change. I laid on the hospital gurney this week. The doctor said, we'll have your biopsies back sometime next week. And suddenly you find yourself going, um, well, wait a second, that is um, okay. Just like that. Your children. or your grandchildren could be gone just like that. What you and I really own is anything that couldn't be gone in an instant. And I can tell you that for me, my house could be gone, my car could be gone, my wife could be gone, my children, my grandchildren, me. There's only one thing I have that's not going to be gone in an instant. And it's my soul. It's the only thing. And it ought to be valued more than anything else. Heaven and earth 
The Bible says what's going to happen to it? Pass away. God says, my word is the only thing that endures. Wow. <laughs> you know, it's amazing how things can wear out. Anybody here have any car trouble this week? Raise your hand. Anybody? Yeah, okay, we had a couple car troubles, yeah. Um, anybody have anything break in their house? Yeah, a couple, all right. Anybody have any health issues this, this week? Yeah, a bunch of people, yeah, I, I know. It, things are wearing out. Your house is wearing out. Your car is wearing out. You're wearing out. I'm wearing out. It's amazing if you ever have an opportunity to travel. You can travel around the world, and one of the things you can see around the world is uh, old things. Of course, you can just come to our church and see old things. <laughs> no. <laughs> just checking to see if you're still awake this morning. If you have a chance ever to travel in South America or Central America, Travel in Central and South America, and you can visit in the middle of the jungle structures that the Mayans, the Incas, the Aztecs built over a thousand years ago. They built stone structures that to this day marvel engineers. Stone structures built with multiple ton stones, hundreds of feet high. And when they were built, things said about them like, this will be here forever. And we haven't even discovered many of them yet. Why? Because they were abandoned and they've been covered up and are getting buried by the jungle. Structures that were built to last and even still have lasted centuries or millennia but are slowly being covered up. The Bible says, for what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world but he lose his soul? The one thing you have of value is your soul. Because it is going to spend eternity somewhere. And you can either lay up treasures for heaven, those things you and I value, what we do as believers for eternity, But even more important than that is your own decision about your own life and your own soul. The Bible says there are two choices, heaven or hell. And every one of us, because we've sinned, the Bible says, are destined for hell. But God has provided the way of redemption, the way of atonement, the way of sacrifice through Jesus the one teaching his followers here today about eternity, that you can spend eternity with him, just like John 14 this morning in Sunday school lesson, where Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one, no one comes to the Father unless they come through me. And so today the choice is yours. You can come to the Father. You can spend eternity in heaven if you come the way the Bible says, through Christ. And if you're willing to give your life to him, if you're willing to tell God you're sorry for your sin, confess it, and you're willing to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life, and you're willing to give God your life, God will forgive your sin, all of it. Cleanse your heart, adopt you as his child. And the only thing you have that will last for eternity, your soul will spend it in heaven if you're willing to come to him his way. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation and invite folks to come and pray and make commitments about things. If you're not sure about whether you're going to spend eternity in heaven, we'd love to talk to you about it before you go today. I'll be standing right here. Just walk down here. Tell me, Pastor, I don't know, but I'd like to know. 
I'd like to settle it today. I've got a few more questions. And somebody will sit down, open God's word, and show you how you can know that you're a child of God. All you need to do is to come. What do you and I value? I love the fact that one day eternity is going to begin, and I wonder where you're going to spend it. To my brother, sister in Christ, it's a hard commitment. It's not easy. Because our society tells us what we want and what's important to us. And much of the time, we buy it. But our own hearts, mine tells me what I want. Yours tells you what you want, what you value. And I wonder this morning if you'd be willing to say, God, it's not about what I value, it's about what you value. God, it's not about what I want, it's what you want. And God, here's the hard part, I'm willing to give you any or all of it. Whether you choose to leave it with me, you choose to take it, you choose to use it, but I'm giving it all to you, God. It is one of the most difficult decisions you can ever make in your life as a child of God. But I can tell you that one day, eternally, you're going to answer to God for everything. Everything God has ever blessed you with, you're going to give an answer to God for it. I was thinking about that this week. I was home on Friday with my little grandson, Colton. Well, not little grandson, Colton. And it was time for his nap. And Pallet said, say good night to Papa. It's time for your nap. And I said, um, say good night to Grammy. And she was having a little trouble getting him to go to sleep. But Grammy doesn't have this built-in mattress. <laughs> and I got in that recliner. And I got him right there. And I began to say, Papa loves you. Yes, he does. I love you so very much. And he's just looking at me. And I just kept singing. And I watched his eyes just. And he went to sleep. If you've been there, you know it's about as good a feeling as there is in all the world. And I began to say, Lord, thank you. Just for this moment. And I had already written my sermon. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, What about him? Um, wait a minute, God. Yes, Lord. You gave him to us. He's not his mama's, his daddy's, his grammy's, or even his papa's. He's yours. 
and whatever is most precious. He's yours. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning? Heads bowed. I have to ask first because it is the most important thing. The only thing you have that's going to last for eternity is your soul. Where will it spend eternity? If you're not sure, we'd love to talk to you about it. If you'd like to know today because the Bible says you can, we'd love to share that with you today. Just come. To my brother, sister in Christ, I'm asking you to make one of the most difficult decisions you can make in life. And that is, God, I want to see everything I have in your eyes. What you value. And I'm willing, I'm willing today to recognize that all of it belongs to you for you to do whatever you want with it. And I'd invite you to come to this altar this morning just between you and God and say, God, I'm willing to give all of it to you. Maybe there's something else you'd like to come, maybe another decision you need to make today that God's speaking to your heart about. Maybe to come and pray for somebody today. Father, I pray that you'd bless our invitation time now. May we be willing to be obedient in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed this morning. Heads bowed as our instrumentalist begins to play. Our invitation is open. Come this morning. joining us for worship today. I hope that you and I are able to look at things from an eternal perspective and recognize that everything we have comes from Him. We're going to have a closing word of prayer. Don't forget our shoebox door will be open and uh, we hope that uh, you have a good week sharing Christ this week. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege of gathering today. Thank you for your presence, for your word. Thank you for the freedom we can have from our sins because of what Christ has done. Thank you that we can know that we're a child of God if we're willing to come your way. And thank you for the blessings we have. Help us to see them from your perspective. Bless us as we go in Jesus' name. Amen.